Hi there once again and welcome to another Expresso Mechanic tutorial. And in this one we're going to be looking at building Caterpillar tracks, but they're not just any Caterpillar tracks because if you move the rig, they all work as you'd expect them to do and everything reacts accordingly. In order to achieve this, we're going to be using a combination of Expresso and some Align to Spline tags. That's what we're about in this tutorial. So without further ado, let's see if we can make this happen. We'll begin by getting hold of a rectangle and we'll also copy it. We'll call this one path and this one we'll call rail. Now both of these need to be set up as follows. 300 in the width, 100 in the height. Rounding needs to be applied and we leave it at 50 because that's perfectly good and our intermediate points need to be set to uniform. So that gives us the initial setup for our rail and path splines. We can leave them set as they are. You can, you can change this if you wish. You can use uh, these, the ZY if you wish to, but I'm gonna leave it on the XY. I think that'll do fine. The next step is to copy these and I'm going to hit option G with them both selected to place them into a null and I'm going to call this original splines and that's fine that's got those stored away in case we have any mishaps and we need to do them again moving on from here we can start thinking about building the treads for the caterpillar tracks that's our next port of call I'll grab a cube Pull it down to the bottom here, hold down option and group this into a null. And I'll call it T. There is a reason why I've placed the cube into the null. I'll explain that a little bit later in the tutorial. Now in the cube here, we want this to be 20 in the X, 3 in the Y and 50 in the Z. And we'll put a fillet of 0.5 on there and that sets it up as I'd like it to be. The next step is to select the T null here and give it an align to spline tag. In the align to spline I'll put the path in the, the spline path, I'll select tangential and I'll pull the rail into the rail path and select the x-axis. Now at the moment nothing is happening and the reason for that is because the rail path here needs to be moved. You only have to move it slightly and then it will set things up as you need it to be. And of course if we now move our cube around it works perfectly. Now if we didn't use the rail path you'll find that the cube will actually rotate at certain points and we don't want that. It will get so far and then as soon as it goes up, well if past this point here, it will actually spin through 180 degrees. You don't want it. And that's why we use the rail path and we align tangentially. Okay, brilliant. So the next thing to do, I'll close the T null, select it, command, drag to copy, and then keep rinsing and repeating this until I've got 32 treads. So one more go and that will give me 32 treads. Now, I don't want 32, I only want 30, so I'm gonna delete the last two. So I've got now T through T29, 30 treads, and they're all set up perfectly well with their path and rails in the align to spline tags. So that's great. So if we select them all, and again, hold down option G, we can group them, and I'll rename this treads. I suppose I could call it track if I wish to, but treads is fine. Great, so that's all ready and it's all working for us. The next port of call, get another null, name it Espresso, and you guessed it, we're gonna give this an Espresso tag. And then we're ready to start creating the first part of our Espresso expression. I'll just move this over here and change the shape a little bit so that we can see what we're doing. The first thing we need to do is bring in a hierarchy. 
Now the hierarchy is referencing espresso because that of course is the null that the espresso tag is on. We want it to be referencing treads. So we'll drag that in there into the reference. That's great. So the next thing we need to bring in is an object index. And we can plumb the hierarchies object output port into the object indexes instance port. Moving on from here, I need another iteration, which is a tag. Bring that in. I can plumb the instance output into the object input. And in the tag, I'm going to select in the date in the, well, the tag type here, I'm going to say align to spline. That's what I'm looking for. They've only got align to splines on them, but as a matter of good practice, it's always a good idea to select the correct tag type from within the tag node. The next thing to do is drag in an align to spline, give it an object port. In the tag properties, a position port. Place that here, ready to go. And then we need a math divide. So we'll get one of those, set the function up as divide, plumb the index output into the input at the top and divide by 30. And now we're ready to go and we can drop our, or plumb our tag output into the object input and then plumb this in here. And straight away, we've got our Caterpillar track created. However, there's more that we need to do if we're going to make this thing work. So what we'll do is grab a hold of, in fact, I'll command drag to copy this one. I'm going to make this an add. Place the output of my divide into here and my output of my add into the position. At the moment, nothing happens because, of course, we're adding zero. However, what I'm going to do on my, well, in fact, what I'll do is create another null. I'm going to call this controller. And for now, and this is only temporary, I'm going to add some user data. And we'll call this just rotation because the track is going to rotate, of course. The data type will be float. The interface will make it a float slider. The unit will be real. And we'll say point. 0, 0, 001 for the unit and or for the step I should say and limit this between 0 and 1 and that's as much as we need to do in there we won't clamp the values we'll leave those open and that's fine so we've got that set up so we've got our user data and it's ready to go now what we'll do is drag our controller into here in fact I'll put it up there and just swap these ports around Place it up there and come down to our user data here, rotation, and plumb this into our math adds input port. And then we can select the controller, move the slider, and we can see that our Caterpillar tracks are rotating perfectly. So that's great. So far, so good. That's the first little bit of this expression done. It does get bigger, but that's the first part of it. And you can test it out by setting up the user data on the controller and playing around with the slider here and you can see that it works. So that's a good test. That's fantastic. Let's look at the next step. OK, so we'll close the Expresso editor window down. But as you can see, this is actually similar to the chain drive that I did. If you've seen the chain drive tutorial, except that it's could be slightly different because we're going to be doing something slightly different with it. But uh, this part of it is pretty much identical to the first part of the chain drive. But anyway, we'll close this down. Moving on from here, what I'm going to do is grab a hold of a cogwheel. Under the teeth tab, what I'm going to do is set the type to flat because I don't need a cogwheel. And the addendum radius, I'm going to make 48. And if we switch to our front view by hitting F4, we can see that that fits pretty much perfectly within our Caterpillar track. 
what I'll do is move this and we'll move it. I'll hold down shift as I do it and we can move it over here until it's basically 100. So we we'll just finish that off and just put 100. I'll command drag to copy it and we'll make this one minus 100. Hit H so that we can see everything. And we've got our two wheels set up so far. I'll select both of them and in the inlay, I want holes. So I'll set that up. At the moment, they're far too big. We need five holes, so we'll leave that as it is. We want a radius of five and a ring radius of 27. That places them in the correct place. And our center hole, I just want 10. That'll be fine for that. And that's looking good. That looks pretty good to me. And that looks as if it's going to work OK. So that's all good. That's our first couple of wheels set up so far. And then what we can do is hold down our option key and drop them both into extrudes. At the moment, they're a little bit too big. We want to make that about 15. And if we come into our top view, so F2 for our top view, we can just take a look at where they are. Now, they're not in the right place. What we need to do in the coordinates, we will move them back or forwards 7.5. And they're in the center now, and that's fine. So that looks nice. We'll also go into our caps and put a small amount of rounding. We'll say 0.5. That should look good. Just gives us a little bit of rounding on there. We've got three segments and I'll leave it at that. So that's great. We've got our couple of wheels set up and we'll call these by well by some appropriate names. Let's call them large wheel one and large wheel two. That'll do nicely for those and we can close them up. Great, so we've got it that far and we can think about adding the two smaller wheels. That'll be the next thing we're going to do. Once again, I'll reach for a cog wheel. And in the teeth, once again, make it flat. And this time I just want 10 mil for the, or 10 centimeters, I should say, for the actual addendum radius. If I just switch to my front view, so F4, we'll see what we're doing a little bit easier. Select inlay and we want holes once again. This time I want three holes. The radius needs to be 1.5. The ring radius six. And the radius of the center hole two. And that set those up correctly. So I can just drop this down to somewhere around the bottom there. And command drag to create a second one. Another thing I'm going to do is change the orientation of the holes so that they're slightly off. That will be fine for that. And I'll do the same with the, with the large cogs uh, for the large wheels. Let's just, let's just select that. And again, the orientation, let's just offset it slightly so they're not exactly the same. And I'll do the same with the other one so that we just get that bit of variety in there. Something like that, I think will do fine. Once again, with these two cogs here, I'm going to select the both of them and drop them by holding down my option key into an extrude. Once again, they're too big. We'll, while, we're, while we're at the caps, we might as well put 0.5 on there. And in the offset, just make them 15 again. Go into our top view and as before, in the Z 7.5 to center them up. And that's all looking good. Excellent. So everything is set up as we want it to be. And we can call this small wheel top. And this one can be called small wheel bottom. So they're all set up and they're all named and they're all ready to go. The next thing we need to think about is doing a little bit of housekeeping. So I'm going to close the treads up. The controller, I'm going to drop down here. 
and select the path and rail and drop those into the controller and I'm going to select all the wheels and drop those into the controller too. And that's fine. That's a good bit of housekeeping that's ready to go. And, that, and this is important because these things do need to be grouped correctly. The treads mustn't be grouped into the controller, but everything else should be. OK, so that's just a little bit of housekeeping done there. I'll just switch to my front view, so F4. The next step for us is to find the overall length of our path spline. Well, path and rail, they're both the same length, obviously. So let's open up the Expresso editor and start looking at how we're going to do this. So the thing we need to do, we'll drag in the path, give it an object port, and then I'll grab a hold of a spline node here and connect the output from the path into the object input of the spline. At the output stage, I will want a length port and then I simply need a result node and I can plumb the length into there. And that tells us the length of our spline is 714.282 units, which will be centimeters, of course. OK, that's fine. So we know what the length of the spline is. We'll just move this up and move this out of the way. What we now need to do is divide the length of our path spline by the circumferential length of this large wheel. Now, I can't use the same method here to get the circumferential length of the wheel because it will, as it's a spline and it's still procedural, the, all of these others will be included in the overall length of the spline. And we don't want that. We just want the outside edge. So the easiest thing to do then is to use a calculator. So I'll bring in my calculator. And I'll say, and we, well, we know that the addendum radius was 48. So I'll times that by 2 to get the diameter and then times that by pi. So 48 times 2 is 96 multiplied by pi. It gives us a value of 301.592. And I'll say memory plus to put that in there. And then we can cancel. Now, we can then get our 714.282, get that into the calculator. Oops, that's not quite right. It should be 282, not 828, 282. And we can divide that by what we've got in the memory. Hit equals, and that gives us 2.368. If we multiply 2.368 by 360, we'll get the number of degrees that the wheel is going to rotate by when the Caterpillar track has done one complete revolution around the wheel. So if we multiply that by 360, what I'll do actually, I'll do 2.368. That's the best thing to do because we can only work in thousandths in Cinema 4D. So 2.368 multiplied by, cancel that a minute, 2.368, 368 multiplied by, that's better, 360. So that gives us 852.48. So we'll leave that in the calculator for now because that's going to be an important number. If we just open the window up a little bigger now, we can start to do a little bit more work. We can move these over here. Now, with the controller, what I'm going to do now is actually remove it from here bring it over here and the rotation port I was I said it was temporary and I no longer need it I'm going to be using position X that's what I need to be using and I'm going to bring in a range mapper so come down to calculate and bring in range mapper and I'm going to plumb the output of the position X there from the controller into the range mapper and plumb the output into the input of the add and just move that beneath there. 
just to give us a little bit more room there and make it a little bit tidier. Now in my range mapper, in my input lower, I can leave that at zero. My input upper, I can say 714.696, or rather 282, I should say, 282. Because I want this value in the, the input upper. The output can be between zero and one, because of course we want a value between zero and one in order to make our spline rotate correctly. Now, if I get a hold of my controller and I move it, we do start to get our tracks moving around our wheels. Of course, the wheels are not moving yet, but we can see that they're doing, or that the, the spline is moving in the correct way. The tracks are moving in the correct way, I should say. So that's fine, that's the first range mapper taken care of. Another thing I'm going to do is make these original splines invisible so that they don't interfere with anything. That's fine, that sorted that out. The next thing we can worry about then is bringing in another range mapper which we're going to use to control the large wheels. So we'll just move this down a little bit. Copy this one. Just bring this down here for now. And in this range mapper, what we're going to need is the number that we've got in our calculator. That's going to be important. So 852.48, that's going to be an important number. So what we've got here then, this is already set up because that's fine. So we want to go from naught to 8. Let's just bring that back up. <laughs> it's going to be 852.48. Okay, 852.48. Now, we might need a minus in front of this. I'm just going to try it and we'll see. But what we'll do first is bring in our two large wheels. Bring these over here. Make them slightly bigger and we want their rotation B. So come down to rotation, rotation B. And we can then plumb the range mapper into both of them. We just move the window again, grab hold of the controller, and let's see what happens. Yeah, now the wheels are spinning, they're not moving correctly, so they're not moving in the right way at the moment. And the reason for that is because the range map is not set up correctly. It's, at the moment, it's set up as an output range of user defined. It needs to be degrees. So it's 852.48 degrees. That's what we need it to be. And that will automatically convert the degrees to radians for us. Let's see what we get now. Aha, now it's working. But as I said, we need a minus in front of the figure there. And now we should find that it works. And it does work. It all works nicely we can see that that's behaving as we wish to as we wish it to behave so we, if we just move that it's actually saying that it isn't quite right is it it's it's actually backwards it's it is moving in in the correct way but it's not moving in the right direction so what we need to do in actual fact is with our controller we need to rotate it through 180 degrees but we need to do that when nothing else is in it. So let's just get a hold of all of these, remove them, and rotate the controller through 180, which we've got, and that's fine. So our controller now is facing in the opposite direction, and we can just put all of these back in it. And let's see what we get now. If we move our controller, and now we've got it right. We can see that it's working perfectly. That's all we needed to do. So that's really nice. The first two wheels are all perfectly synchronized with the Caterpillar track, and it's all looking really good. So moving on from here then, we've got to do the same deal for the small wheels. We've got to literally divide their circumferential length into the Caterpillar tracks and get a number that's going to work for them. And that's the next port of call. So if we open up one of our small wheels and get the cog, we can see, if we go into the teeth, the addendum radius was 10. So let's get the calculator. 
we'll all cancel, get rid of everything in there, and we'll say, so this is a radius, so we're going, we'll times it by 2, 20 multiplied by pi is equal to 62.831. So if we say memory plus and cancel, we can then divide that into the 714.282. So 714.282 divided by what we've got in the memory. And that's not correct, is it? No, that isn't correct. So why is the memory completely corrupted? We don't want that. Get rid of it. Memory cancel. Get rid of it. This is a little bit buggy, actually, this calculator, I always find. So let's go 10 multiplied. Well, it's multiplied by 2 multiplied by pi is equal to 62.831. Memory plus cancel. 714.282 divided by memory. Thank you is equal to, right, so 11.368. So 11.368 rotations once the tracks have traveled through one complete revolution. So again, if we say 11.368, 11.368 multiplied by 360, we get 4092.48. OK, so that's another important number. So in our range mappers, what we can do once again, if we move this a little higher, move this out of the way, get another range mapper, plumb the position X from the controller into the input. And again, the input range is perfectly correct. But this needs to be changed. Let's get that calculator back up. So it's going to be minus 4092.48. Minus 4092.48. And that's fine. That's set the range mapper up. And then all we need to do is bring in both of our small wheels. Bring them in. Make them bigger. Once again, we want rotation B. Rotation B, plumb in the range mapper, and now let's have a quick check and see what we've got. So let's get the controller, we'll go into our front view, so F4 again, and let's see what we've got. And we can see that they're working perfectly, and it's all looking really, really nice now. Yeah, that's great. So all of our wheels are perfectly synchronized with our tracks. Superb, exactly what we needed to happen. So simple calculations have enabled us to do this stuff. Moving on from here then, what we now need to do is make this a little bit less like computer graphics because the treads don't look particularly natural, do they? They're all mathematically perfect and they don't look quite as we perhaps like to see them in reality. So we're going to take a look at how we're going to make it possible to make them jiggle about as they would if they were real Caterpillar tracks. Now, before we get into that, I'm just going to change to my front view again. So function four. I said earlier that I would placed the treads into nulls or the cubes into nulls because there was a reason why it, it, you know, it might be useful to you. Well, one of the reasons is that you can, of course, now offset these slightly. So you could make your tracks a little bit more uneven if you wish to. Also, of course, if you did wish to, you could actually do a lot more modeling and you could, you know, put connection bits and stuff like this underneath them and, and, and parts here where if this would probably be a cog type wheel, wouldn't it? A sprocket. Um, and you could make indentations in this which would actually connect with the teeth of the sprockets and allow the treads to move around and you might want to do a little bit more modeling here and then offset it for that reason so that they were a little bit further away from the actual cogs so there's a that's the reason why i would suggest placing these in nulls i mean for this tutorial i haven't bothered going there it's, it's there's no need to go that far but uh, you may wish to do that yourself so that's the reason why i've done that 
But anyway, let's just go back. No, thanks. Don't want those. Let's just go back to our 3D view and have a think about what we're going to do in order to make these uh, jiggle about. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is bring in two nulls and I'm going to drop the two nulls into the controller. Now, at the moment, they're in the middle of the world. We need to position them. But I'm also going to draw or drop in another couple of nulls as well and place each of these inside these two nulls. Right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to call this one T1 and this one T2. And then we'll think about positioning them. So once again, I'm going to switch to my front view, so F4. And let's see where these are. Now, what we need to do is just get the controller here, check its coordinates, and just zero this out. And these nulls, I just want to zero them out too for the minute. Let's just get everything back to zero. That's fine. And then what I'll do is bring them to, well, what we'll do with this first one, I think, is bring this to position 50. So we'll set that to 50 in the X. And this one can be minus 50. So minus 50. And then we can move both of them up by 50. So we can say 50 in the Y. So now they're lined up with the top of our path and rail splines. And these two are as well. Great, so we've got it that far. The next step is to select both our path and rails and hit C to make them editable. And now let's just go into points mode and see what we've got. Let's just select them again. OK, so we've got points here, which are going to be useful to us, and points here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just get into my selection tool here, and I will uncheck visible only and select here. Hold down shift and select here. Hit subdivide, and that gives me a center point on both of them. And I'm going to select this and this so that I've got all three of those points selected. Hit control, subdivide again. And now I've got two points here and here that align with both of the spline um, and the nulls that I put in there. So that's fine. That's what I want. Now, one thing I am going to do is select my path here. And just select this particular point. And then I'm going to come up to Window and select the Structure Manager. Now, in the Structure Manager, I've got point four selected. I've got 10 points on this spline. Now, let's just select this point. And I just want to move it. And I want to make sure that that point is not actually two points one on top of the other, because I've had a problem with this, and it, it's something that will cause us problems if that's the case. That doesn't appear to be there, so let's just bring that back, and let's select this point and see if we've got a problem. No, we haven't. We've, we've still got one point there. OK, so that's all good. So we've got 10 points, and we're OK, or 11 points, actually, from 0 to 10. So that should be OK for us. I mean, if it isn't, we'll have to do some work later on, but we'll we'll assume that we're all OK at the moment. So I'll hit H. So, so far, we've got a couple of nulls in here with some targets in them. And we've now got our path spline and rail spline set up as editable splines. And they've got a few more points in them. The next thing we're going to need to do is use these two nulls. We're going to make them move up and down. And we're going to make them carry these two points that we've, we've got here and here with them so that the tracks actually follow them and bounce up and down. The first thing I'm going to do is open the Expresso Editor once again and move this up a little bit further, move this down a little bit further to get it out of the way, and then create two more range mappers. Now, in my first one here, what I'm going to do I'm going to divide. Well, before I do that, I'm going to connect up the controller. Actually, we'll do that first, get that done, because that won't do any harm. In this first one here, what I'm going to do is divide this value by 10. 
and I'm going to do the same in the second one. So we'll divide by 10. And I'm also going to, in both of them, switch on this modulo, check the modulo here, because we want this to repeat. This is important. So we'll do that, and that's got it so far. Now, in the output lower, we want a value of minus 1, and in the output upper, a value of 1. Because all we're going to do is move these nulls up and down by a value of no more than 1. So that's what we're about with this. In order to achieve this, we need to make use of the spline. So what I'm going to do is command and click to create the first point. I'll just twirl this open. And my point Y needs to be 0.5 for my first point. And I'm going to pull another point over here and do the same thing, 0.5. So zero is this. This, of course, will represent zero because we're working from minus one to one. So the center point has got to be zero and that's essential. So that will leave our null at the zero point. Moving on from here, then we'll just add some more points. So and just literally randomly place these. We the, it's not specific because, of course, we want this to look as if it's just jiggling about at random. So that's the effect that we're trying to create here by doing this. We'll just bring these in. Let's pull that out a little bit just to make it a little bit smoother. Bring this one, say, down here. This one can go a little higher. Drop this one down to the bottom. This one we can put somewhere near the center. Drop this one down here. And you can, you know, just do this however you choose to. There's nothing specific about any of this. And then that one, we can just bring that out a little bit and bring that one out a little bit. And that'll do fine. I think that should work for us. That'll give us the desired effect. So that's the first uh, spline taken care of. I've done it in both range mappers. Now what I'm going to do, this one I'll leave as it is, but this one I'm going to just do some more work with. So I'll actually invert it so that they're not both exactly the same because that wouldn't look right, would it? It would be a bit unnatural. So we'll just have a little bit of a play around with these. Move that one right down to the bottom. That one somewhere up there, down here, up here, and down here. So now we've got two different splines. We've got that one and we've got this one. And they're not going to match up, which is exactly what I want. OK, so that's all looking good. Let's just get a hold of that one there. That's it. Just want to make that a bit more smooth. That one can perhaps be smoothed a little bit. And similarly we can do something just there okay great i'm satisfied with that i think that's going to work so the next thing we can do then just to test this out we can actually bring in t1 and t2 so bring in t1 t2 and at the input stage we can say position y okay that's fine so we've got that far Great, and we can plumb these two into them. Now let's see what happens. What we'll do actually is select both of these and in the object I'll give them circles so that we can see them more easily. Now when we move the controller, what happens? Do we get anything? Are we getting any results at all? I'm not sure that we are at the moment, so let's see why. Let's have a look at our range mappers. They're all plumbed in there. Oh, we've got the output range as degrees. Now that's where the problem lies. So let's just make this user defined and that hopefully should solve the problem. Now let's have a go. Does it solve it? It doesn't seem to, does it? What else have we got in here then? So our input lower is zero. Our output upper is 71 point. Ah, I can see why, because that needs to be minus one and that needs to be one. 
Let's see what we've got. Yeah, now they're working. You can see they're jiggling about. That's what we want. Just hit H there to bring everything back into the window. Or in fact, what I'll do, I'll just view everything at 100%. That's better. Just move that up. Okay, great. So we're all set up and we can see that that's working. That's working fine. Lovely. So that's the first little bit of it. The next stage then is to actually give these positions to the positions of the points that we need to actually move with them. And that will give us the result that we want. The first thing I'm going to do is set up the output stages of T1 and T2 in the nodes here. And they need to be global position Y at the output stage. So inputs, position, global position at the outputs. OK, and that's, of course, because they're actually grouped. So that is important. Moving on from here, we need to establish which points we want to work with. Well, we know that T1 is over here. And if we select our spline path and we select our structure manager, at the moment we've got point four selected in our points, but if we click on here, we get point two. So we know that T1 lines up with point two. So that must mean that T2 lines up with point four. Excellent. So everything's good and we know where we're going with this now. And let's just zoom in to 100%. Right, good. Just need this over here. So let's get some point nodes in and we'll start setting these up. So we'll get a point node and we'll copy it three times. So command drag to copy. Oops, three times. So just resize that. And command drag again to copy. So we've got four point nodes. Now we've got our path here, but what we'll do, just to leave this in the expression, I'll copy my path. I'll also bring in my rail and get those set up ready. I'll just give that an object output port. I'm not going to plumb anything in yet. Now, what I'm going to do first is select these two and give them point index two because we said that point index two would line up with T1. I need to give both of these an index value, a point index value of four. So I've got the two set up and the fours set up. I'm just going to move these out of the way because the next step is to bring in two reels to vector nodes. So we need to bring those in. They're in the adapters. So reels to vector. Bring those in here and we need to set these up. So I'll just command drag to get a second one. We need to set them up with the correct values. Right, so let's just move this out of the way. I just want to check something here. So T1's position, whereabouts is that going to be? And we've got to think global position here. So let's just check the null. So that's 50 and this null is minus 50. So T1, so if, if we're going to use this with T1, we'll plumb the Y into here. And the X for the null, we said, let's just double check. So we said 50, didn't we? So in here, the X value has got to be 50. The Z is zero. So this one then, the X is going to be minus 50. We need to plumb the Y into here and leave the Z at zero. Now, let's see what we've got. So T1 is going to deal with these two and T2, these two. So we can plumb this in. Now, we've got to say point position in all of them. So let's just do this point position. And get them all plumbed in. 
there. So that's the first bit of the setup. We know that the index values have all been set correctly. In fact, we'll just go back here and view 100%, I think, just to make them a little bit bigger so that we could see everything. And then all we need to do then is connect up our path and our rail. So our path, we can connect into here. We can also connect it into here because we've got two points on the path and two points on the rail, so they're set up. And then we can just repeat this process with the rail. So we can plumb this into here and plumb this into here. And all things being fair, if I've done this correctly, it should work. So let's see if it does. But actually, it appears to have gone a bit haywire. Now let's just check to see, yes, it has. So why might this be happening? Well. It's nothing to really panic about. I mean, if we just go into our top view, so our function two to go up there, you can see that the splines look a real mess, don't they? And at first glance, this looks really horrifying and it looks as if there's been a complete disaster. But actually, it's very, very easy to fix. If we just bring the window back up a minute, I'll bring this to here so that I can show you what's going to happen. Now, if we select all four of these, we can see that they've got a matrix mode, which is set to global. All we've got to do you set it to local and instantly it fixes the problem. So if you get that problem, make sure your matrix mode for your point nodes is set to local and it will sort things out perfectly. Right, so let's close down the Expresso window for now. Go back into our front view, so F4, H to see everything and let's just see what's going on. And we can see that that is now working as it should. The points are following the nulls. Now, one other thing that we need to do, it's not quite working as I'd like because I feel that the tracks should be heavier. So let's add some weight. All we've got to do, if we select both of these nulls, all we've got to do is draw them down slightly and now we've added weight. And if we select our controller now and move it around, you can see that that looks really nice. I'll just switch back to the 3D view, so F1. And let's just move this around. So let's just see. Yeah, and we can see that that looks much, much more natural now. If you do it slowly, you can see that they're all moving around in a nice jiggly sort of way as if there's weight on the top of that caterpillar track there. And it looks much better. As you can see, it now looks like something which is far more realistic rather than shouting, this is computer graphics as it did before. So that's it. That's how you go about creating an interactive Caterpillar track that you can make work simply by moving the rig. So I hope you've learned a lot from this tutorial and that it's something that you can use in your own projects. And if you've enjoyed the video, then please give it a like. And if you haven't already, then please subscribe to the channel. And of course, leave a comment and ring the bell. And wherever you happen to be on social media, then please, please share this video because all of this good stuff really does help the channel keep on moving in the right direction. But anyway, that just about wraps this one up. So I'll see you very soon on the next tutorial.